It was with the release of the Sega Mega Drive, or the Sega Genesis if you were to get North American about this, that the inter-console wars between Nintendo and Sega truly stepped up a notch. On the one hand, you have Nintendo, the entrenched power that be with their unstoppable mascot, Mario. And on the other hand, you have Sega, a renowned producer of video games in their own right. But what could Sega do to step to Nintendo? Two things, games and marketing. It was from this generation that we saw the infamous Genesis Does What Nintendo Don't adverts, as well as several other over-the-top, in-your-face direct digs at the competition. And while Sega's answer to Mario wasn't available at launch, this advertising strategy ultimately paid off, weakening Nintendo's grip on territories outside of Japan. But what of those launch games? Well, today we'll be folding in the Japanese and US launch lineups for the Sega Mega Drive and Sega Genesis, as well as the US launch lineup for the Sega 32X add-on. I was considering the Sega CD as well, but I really don't think there's a huge amount to be learned from Marky Mark Make My Video. Come on, come on! He's so cute. Girls, can live with him and shoot him. Are you ready? Then let's do this. Oh, hold on a minute. Before we get started, there seems to be a fair amount of confusion online surrounding what does and what doesn't constitute as a launch game for the Mega Drive and Genesis. In a lot of instances, the game releases don't line up with the console. Some Wikipedia articles state that there are two Japanese launch games, while others state four. So all this is to say, essentially, that I've done my best to be as accurate as possible. Okay, and now on with the video. The fifth title in the Alex Kidd series, Alex Kidd in the Enchanted Castle sees little Alex attempt to find his father, King Thor, and this game is wild. Normally in a side-scroller, you don't tend to have many issues identifying your enemies because you just attack everything, right? But here, when the enemies take the form of cars and miniature planes, all bets are off. When I managed to make it past the first car, I popped into this house, lost a game of rock, paper, scissors, and had a weight dropped on my head. I was then hit by another car. Accidentally digging down, I found myself in some kind of dungeon, picked up a MacGuffin, and was transported to the next stage where the enemies were dung beetles and mole... rat things? The game is brutal, then, and many critics took issue with the controls. IGN called it all very random and not fun at all, and it ended up with a score of 47.5% according to game rankings. Oh, bugger. Well, let's have one more go, then. No! Yeah. This. Next game, please. Rise from your grave. I don't like the synthesized speech. Make it stop, please. Originally a popular arcade game, and in this instance the chosen pack-in title for the Genesis and Mega Drive in North America and Europe, Altered Beast is a beat-em-up set in Greece. Your character has been resurrected by Zeus in an effort to rescue his daughter. A bold and noble task, to be sure, but the gameplay doesn't really reflect that. Okay, that might not be fair. It did its best with the hardware of the time, and I did enjoy how you evolve into a buffer man with a torn shirt, then a really buff man with no shirt and a tiny head, which looks familiar actually. And then, finally, you become the Beast Wars. In this form, you're far more powerful and able to fire projectiles just like a beast would. It's not hugely fun, however, and can get very hectic on screen, with many retrospectives on the game describing it as merely decent with some nostalgic value. 51% according to game rankings.
A much-anticipated port for the industry-defining Doom was just what Sega's 32X add-on needed. After all, the title had only been out on PC for a year and it had already reached near-legendary status. What 32X purchases received, however, was not quite what was promised. In fairness, the game is largely there. You run and gun your way through gory atmospheric levels with a pounding soundtrack looking for keycards and more deadly weaponry to slay demons with. Sadly, the game is missing parts of levels, the BFG is missing without a cheat, and as you can see, Doom on the 32X is massively pixelated. Like, hugely compressed. Half the time you don't know if it's a demon up on that ledge or a kebab the demons left behind. I also found the controls quite challenging. Turns out you can strafe, but it requires the holding of a button at the same time, making the game playable but still quite obtuse. Reviews are all over the place, with the highest praise reaching scores of 100% and the lowest reaching 20%. 73.5% according to the reviews on Moby Games. The sequel to 1985's Ghosts and Goblins, Ghouls and Ghosts, continues to follow the misadventures of poor knight Arthur as he once again must traverse a monster-infested hellscape in the hopes of saving his beloved princess Prin Prin. So, a, a sort of Tim Burton Super Mario, if you will. Fun fact, the Mega Drive port was handled by one Yuji Naka. You know, before he worked on that game. The art style is beautiful, dark and foreboding, successfully utilising every drop of power the now primitive system had. Just get a load of those pants. Oh, and yes, this is a challenging one. Like many of these launch titles, the game made the leap from arcades, where their intention was to make as much money from players as possible, and that meant lots of game over screens. You can open chests and get some very shiny armour, but sometimes a nasty surprise can appear there instead. Ghouls and Ghosts was very well received by critics, achieving 80% according to game rankings. All is not well with the world. A great war had devastated the land and a nefarious power had established an empire where the good people were treated like slaves, but there's hope. The mighty Azrak and his two companions elicit- Can we- can we slow that down a bit, please? Oh, here he comes. The last hero. And what a surprise, it's another buff man who rips his shirt off and walks to the right. Wait, what are you doing? Oh god, I'm sorry, I take it back, what the hell? <laughs> Last Battle was a Fist of the North Star game in Japan. The international version was not, and so it was even more bland. As you've already guessed, in Last Battle, you walk to the right and punch people. You don't even have to be close to do so. See? That's power right there. It does have an overworld map where you can choose your next destination, some of which include arena mini-bosses, and you can kick knives out of the air, and the impact noises sound like RuneScape sound effects. But the controls are imprecise and frustrating. Watch me bounce off these boulders and take damage each time. What a hero. I didn't think it was very fun, and critics agreed due to its stiff controls, poor dialogue, and no continues. 45% according to game rankings. The only of four Japanese launch titles do not see an international release, Osamatsu-kun Hachamicha... Ge Geki Joe. Oh, <laughs> sorry. It's based on the long running comedy manga series Osamatsu Kun and sees the player control Osamatsu, the leader of his sextuplet brothers. Now, I don't read or speak Japanese, but I was immediately in love with this bonkers art style. It's the first of these launch games, after all, I've played with any real colour. For example, what on earth is that? Is it a dog? Why is its face so human-like? Oh good, it's a green thing! These fine dogs are dropping bones, and now there's this red guy! Around every corner is a new, horrible surprise. The game was mercifully forgiving with its deaths and lives, and includes a number of power-ups and ribbons that can be used to purchase items from an in-game shop. Quite fleshed out then. Unfortunately, however, the game was largely panned by players and critics for a baffling progression system that forced you to proceed through levels in a very particular manner if you wanted to see the whole game. Just look at this madness. 51% according to an average of reviews listed on Sega Retro. 
When you hear the name Space Harrier 2, you probably think the game's going to be about a Space Harrier jet, right? Wrong! You're a very fast man who has a big cannon and can float. Bet you feel silly now, don't you? Receiving an alert that Fantasyland has fallen into crisis now, it's your job to run and float around the screen shooting at incoming enemies. I recognise that death sound. The game uses a clever 3D slash depth of field effect to simulate a three-dimensional perspective. However, with the camera shifting constantly, it can make it very difficult to hit opponents or dodge projectiles, and it can also make you feel very unwell. I found it easier to run along the floor in the end, just murdering the hell out of trees. Smug, smug trees. There's some nice ideas in here, but I'd say as a game it's just fine at best and irritating at its worst. Plus, it plays nice upbeat music when you die. How kind. 54% on game rankings. For its time, the Sega 32X port of Star Wars Arcade is seriously impressive. Yes, the opening crawl does look like it uses the font from an early Simpsons game, but there are Star Destroyers, Death Stars, and with limited control inputs, the experience is surprisingly involved. Combining events from Episodes 4 and 6, Star Wars Arcade originally released in arcades in 1993, a year prior to its home console debut. Armed with proton torpedoes and regular fire, you can speed up or slow down to avoid enemy fire and obstacles. Sadly though, this movement is extremely limited. While it is still possible to fully bank around and explore the 3D space, chasing your attackers down is all but impossible, so you have to sort of wait for them to go past before you're able to engage. It's certainly a visual spectacle, but with repetitive objectives essentially kill so many ships to proceed, and sluggish manoeuvrability, Star Wars Arcade wasn't quite as well received as it perhaps could have been. Plus, it has this upsetting synthesized speech. Wipe out enemy fighters! No thank you. 68.5% according to the reviews I could find online. A game in which inverted controls are enabled by default. Ugh, gross, disgusting! Well, I was yeah. one of yes. I mean, it is a flight combat game, sort of, so I suppose it makes sense. Piloting a helicopter and destroying incoming tanks, aircraft, and hang on, is that a Metal Gear? Why are we still here? I quickly learned that your projectiles automatically hit enemies, so all you really have to do is list lazily in a vague square motion to avoid enemy fire, which can get a little boring. In addition, the screen very quickly becomes incredibly busy and loud, and matters aren't helped much by the sluggish controls. As such, if you're not slowly traversing the screen, you'll die a lot. I did give these office workers quite the show, though. The arcade original was simply titled Thunderblade, and while there were some tweaks and additions between entries, Super Thunderblade ended up losing gameplay sections that may have diversified the playing experience a bit more. 49.58% on game rankings. Thunder Force 2 originally released in Japan for the Sharp X68000 computer before arriving on the Mega Drive a year later. One of the main purported differences between these versions, however, was the original had a map for the overworld or top view stages, and the Mega Drive version did not. As such, I really struggled with Thunder Force 2 to begin with. I felt as though I was aimlessly flying around a vast map with no idea of what to do or where to go. And then you add punishing combat to the mix, your chances of winning drastic go down. There are power-ups to collect that alter your weaponry and provide shield buffs, and once I'd gotten used to the fly directly at enemies to kill them and hope beyond hope you shoot them before they do style of gameplay, I did alright. However, with no map, I had no way of knowing there are entire horizontal side-scrolling sections of the game too. Here's someone far more competent than me playing it. While it was certainly a vague trial by fire, Thunder Force 2 reviewed well with critics, achieving 72% on game rankings. Oh yeah, here we go, sports time! I've played a baseball game before. Hang on, where are you going? But I've never watched baseball, so I'm going to give this everything I've got. It's the home of my beloved 69ers, so naturally, I've got to go with San Francisco. And I am already hopelessly lost. What does it mean? You want the numbers, Mason. That's all we've ever wanted. Now I've got to work out how to swing. Oh, 
I mean, that was kind of right. Can the uh, next guy please try it? Okay, well, third time's the charm, I suppose. Yes! No! My run of being terrible at hitting balls with sticks seems to be continuing, so let's try some quick throws instead. And it turns out I'm really good at that. Look how far they're hitting them. Can't hit them far without a great pitch. Also, you manually have to move the catchy boys around and I didn't realise for ages, which might explain why this guy isn't lifting a finger. Come on, big hit. Yes! Come on! Oh, yeah. no. Safe! 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 73% according to the reviews listed on Sega Retro, and while the game didn't feature his name outside of North American releases, a big sports time salute to Tommy Lasorda and his contributions to baseball. Lasorda passed away last month at the age of 93. Virtua Racing took arcades by storm when it was first released in 1992, and it wasn't long before fans were clamouring for a home console port. And a port did indeed come to base Mega Drive and Genesis consoles, however the cartridges had to be fitted with a special chip that allowed it to run properly, and this pushed the cost of the cartridge way up. Fast forward to the launch of the 32X add-on, and not only did the game function as intended, but also included two additional car options, stock and prototype. The game is really quite fun, with lots of different tracks to choose from. Naturally, as a hangover from being an arcade title, the main thrust is seeing how long you can go for before the timer runs out. It is possible to finish a race, but good god is that hard work. Hitting other vehicles and losing traction artificially slows your chosen car to practically a stop, and while the multiple camera options are welcome, the first person view just doesn't show enough of what's ahead to make it viable. That and it makes you feel poorly, and that you need glasses. However, these are all issues that the unstoppable march of technology brings to the fore, and in 1994, this was best in class racing. 87%, according to the reviews, I could find online. And that 87% brings the total average score of the Mega Drive's launch lineup to 62.67%. And there we are, every Sega Genesis slash Sega Mega Drive launch title sort of reviewed in 2021. Were there any among them that were your favourites? Why not let me know about it in the comments below? Why not also follow me on Twitter if you'd like to keep up to date with future videos in this series, and also like this video, share the video with your friend, and subscribe to the channel as well. I very much appreciate that. Thank you so much for watching, look after yourself, and I will see you very soon. Bye!